there are three baskets up here, three big baskets, all right? At the, at the, maybe they're right down here in front. And I want you to imagine that in one of the baskets we have Monopoly money. It's full of Monopoly money. And imagine that the other basket has $1 bills and the other basket has $100 bills. In a minute, we're going to blow a whistle and you have one minute to gather whatever you want. How many of you would run over here and get Monopoly money? Yeah, I didn't think so. That's what we're going to talk about today. If you ever had the privilege of going over to Pastor Leo's house uh, and Susan, they, uh, they have a beautiful mural. and uh, It's a photograph. It's a wide-angle panorama uh, of, a, of a national park, a glacier national park. Beautiful. And Pastor Leo's a, a photographer. He took that himself. And so when we went over there for dinner, I said, well, it's a beautiful photograph. And he said, it's really like four photographs all stitched together. To see the picture, you have to put a number of different pictures all together. And today, the Christian church pauses, and they all turn their attention to a story about Jesus. And that story is found in all four of the Gospels, the little miniature biographies of Jesus. That story is found in every single one of those. And if we stitch those pictures together, we see a beautiful portrait, a beautiful picture of something that happened in Jesus' life. And it's an important one. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't be found four times in the Bible. So take your Bible and open your Bible to Matthew and and, uh, chapter 21. Matthew and chapter 21. And we're going to read, it's in verses 1 through 11. And we're going to read this story from Matthew chapter 1 and verses 1 through 11. It's in Mark 11, it's in John 12, it's in Luke 19 too. So we're going to read it from Matthew uh, and 21, uh, 1 through 11. Then maybe we'll, we'll look at John a little bit later on. We'll look at a piece in Luke because it adds something else. And then we're going to answer the question, why is this important? Like why, why, is, this imp- why is this so important? So here we go, let's look at the Bible. Matthew 21, 1 through 11, the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus. When they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what's spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went, and they did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt, and they put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And The crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of of Galilee. Turn to John chapter 12. We'll just read the story from John chapter 12. It's brief, but it adds a bit more color to the story. Here's what it says in John and chapter 12 and verse 12. John chapter 12 and verse 12. Now the next day, the large crowd, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me set this up. You notice the section before it, the Pharisees are unhappy with Jesus. And why are they unhappy with Jesus? They're really not happy with him because he raised the dead. The, the religious leaders of the day were unhappy with Jesus because he raised 
Lazarus from the dead. And if you haven't read this lately, when I read it to you, you ought to be really shocked. In chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, A large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there. They came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest celebrated this resurrection. There, I did that pastor thing. I misread the Bible on purpose. What did the chief priest do? This is amazing, right? The religious guys got together and they plotted to murder Lazarus to undo, to undo Jesus' miracle. That's amazing. The, the, the links that religious people, the evil links that sometimes religious people will go to. These guys said, well, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, so he's really popular, so maybe we should just kill him. And it says in verse 11, because on account of him, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And now we get to the triumphal entry. So this is where the crowd's coming from. Part of the crowd, you know, comes from Jerusalem out to meet Jesus. He's in Bethany on the backside of the Mount of Olives, staying with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And now he's coming into Jerusalem, coming around the Mount of Olives and down, and he'll go into the Kidron Valley and up into Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, a crowd is coming to meet him because they heard he's coming and Jerusalem is swelled to hundreds of thousands of people because it's the observance of the Passover. It's a it's a time of the year that's just electric with excitement because it's a festival and because it's a festival when they often kept the doors of the temple open the jews kept the doors of the temple open symbolically to welcome messiah they're wanting messiah to come so the doors of the temple are open and the people are in a very you know high level of excitement and now there's this word that jesus has raised lazarus from the dead and that he's coming and now they're going to go out to meet him in john chapter 12 and verse 12 it says the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written, fear not, O daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard this was done, this sign was done. He had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The Pharisees were all concerned that they were losing their market share of the religious market. But here Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Now he's coming into Jerusalem, and he's coming in on the day of pass, before Passover when the sacrificial lambs present themselves. He's coming through the gate where the lambs come through. He, the gates of the temple are open because the people anticipate the presentation of the Messiah. The people get palm branches and this would have been a powerfully symbolic thing it would be a little bit like to rome they would have seen that almost like burning the roman flag because the palm branches the idea of the palm branches would go back to the maccabean revolt and the people saying now we have our king the king of israel is here and they're they're almost declaring their independence rome always sends extra soldiers to Jerusalem at this time to keep things in check because it's a very volatile, explosive, political environment. And Jesus, when he comes in, you might expect him to ride like a, a Roman steed, a war horse, but he doesn't do that. And over and over again, the Bible says why. He's specifically fulfilling a prophecy to come and present himself as the king, as the Messiah, but he's doing it in, the, in a way that the Bible describes it in Zechariah on a baby donkey. So he comes in an unusual way, not as a conquering hero warlord. He's coming peacefully to bring in a kingdom that people really don't understand in a quiet and subtle way. And yet the symbolism was direct and he arranged it himself. This wasn't something like people decided to be excited about Jesus, and so they 
took an unwilling Jesus and kind of drug him in town. This was uh, Jesus, this is the one and only demonstration that Jesus actually arranged himself. He knew he was getting himself in trouble with the people. He arranged a demonstration. He came in in fulfillment of prophecy. He presented himself as Israel's Messiah. But like it says in John chapter 12, they really didn't understand. Even his uh, loyal followers didn't really have it put together because they had kind of forgotten their Awana verses, right? And, and, they, and they, had, they needed to put those together. And then after he was died and after he was buried and after he rose again and after he went back to heaven which in john 12 is called when he was glorified then they went back over their awana verses and then they remembered what they'd been taught and the things that had been done to him and they kind of began to put the pieces together but his even his closest followers were blinded by the political climate they were looking for military deliverance right from the cruel roman the boot on their neck from Rome. They wanted out of that, and they saw Jesus as the way out of that. They had their agenda, and they thought, here's this powerful man who raises the dead, and he cast out demons, and he cleanses lepers, and maybe he can help us throw off the Roman yoke. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. So he comes, and, and he presents himself as the Messiah, and some other things happen. And when you put all the accounts together, if you have a harmony of the gospels you can see kind of the chronology of how things happen in in holy week at the end of the day after he presents himself he goes back to bethany he spends the night sometimes jesus would spend the night in the home of mary and martha and lazarus that was common the bible says the son of man had nowhere to lay his head the bible says that sometimes he spent a night in the wilderness i believe that maybe some of those nights during that spring week that he died he spent on the Mount of Olives under the full moon, perhaps warming his hands over a fire outdoors and overlooking Jerusalem and thinking about what was about to happen to him. It's a powerful scene. Jesus is, um, the clock is running and the things that Jesus said would happen are starting to happen. And Jesus is presenting himself as Israel's king and Israel's confused about it. There, there are really kind of three groups if you think about it. It's the group, primarily, probably loyal Galileans. Jesus had done his ministry up in the north in Galilee, and he had healed the sick and raised the dead and walked on water and caught fish and fed the, the fish and loaves to thousands of people and done most of his miracles and ministry and touched most lives in Galilee. And there were Galilean loyalists who were with him that came there, and they were the ones that just continually were bearing witness and telling everyone that's one crowd, if you will. There was the crowd coming from Jerusalem that were curious, that were interested, maybe not the same level of uh, devotion and loyalty, very interested because they'd heard of the raising of the dead and they had messianic hopes perhaps, or they were just plain curious people. As human nature is, here's a crowd of people now, they're coming out and they're meeting the crowd that's coming in. But in the crowd also were people that were literally willing to plot to murder a person in order to overthrow Jesus' popularity. And so every once in a while on Palm Sunday, pastors will say, the crowd was fickle. The people that cried, Hosanna on Sunday, cried, crucify him on Friday. That's good poetry, but it might not be accurate. Because it may not be the people that most cried, Hosanna on Sunday, that cried, crucify him on Friday. We don't know for sure. We do know that there were different groups of people, just like in the house today. We all have a little different take on this story. I doubt if there's, there are many people here today that would consider themselves enemies of Jesus, rebellious against him, haters, you know, of Jesus. I doubt maybe there's nobody in the, in the house like that, but you, you know people like that. They hate that story. They, they reject it. They, they, they think it's kind of behind a lot of evil in the world. Then there are people, there are a handful of people who have a really clear and a precise understanding of what's going on in the world and who Jesus is. But then there are a lot of people that are just a little foggy about it. And when that story kind of gets foggy to us, that's when, we, that's when we start building plastic kingdoms out of monopoly money. That's when we start doing things that aren't really going to matter that much when time goes on. That's when we start kind of burning down our lives. Or that's when we ask Jesus, we hear about Jesus, we hear about God, we hear about the Holy Spirit, and we think, 
I think I'd like to have someone that powerful on my team. I think I have plans that he could help fulfill. There are things I would like to accomplish that if Jesus was on my team, I could accomplish. That's exactly what these people were doing that day. That we have some things we'd like to accomplish. Oh, wait, here's a miracle worker. Maybe he can join my kingdom. Maybe he can serve me. And don't laugh. That's kind of the sum total of a lot of people's religion. What can he do for me? Let's answer this question, though. Why is this story here? Why is it was repeated four times? So it must be an important story. So let me, let me suggest some answers to the question, why is this story so important? This story of the king presenting himself and of the people opposing him or misunderstanding him and of them having their own ideas about the kingdom. Why would that be important for us today here a week before Easter? Let me suggest this. Here's why. Because there is a kingdom now. There is a kingdom right now. Now, to show you this, I found this really interesting. You know, when you, when you read your Bible, you get to the book of Acts. You know that the book of Acts is the story of the young church, right? It's the Acts of the Apostles. That would be the, 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 the church is built on the foundation of the Apostles. Uh, the Apostles were men who were sent by Jesus after they'd seen him after his resurrection with a message of the resurrection uh, to go into all the world and then and to kind of call out people to follow Jesus and create these little Jesus clusters and these little clusters of Jesus people would spread throughout the earth and we're here today because of them and this is the record of that the book of Acts is the record of that but here's the thing that most people I, I don't think they normally see and that is sometimes that movement that jesus movement we we might call it the church or we might call it the advance of the gospel that jesus movement in the book of acts is frequently called guess what the kingdom the kingdom it's called the kingdom now just to just so that you thinking clearly i believe that there's an expression of the kingdom all the time there's an expression of the kingdom here in what we might call the church age, there's going to be a literal 1,000-year reign in the future, I believe. There's going to be an eternal state, which is the fullest expression of the kingdom. It's a word God likes to use, and it's a good word. So to think of kingdom and to think of king, they're good things to think about on a day when the children wave the palm branches, right? Because there is a current kingdom. Now, when you get to the book of Acts, and you can go with me if you're fast with your Bible, we're going to do a little survey of the book of Acts. Don't worry, this will be painless and brief. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, it's talking about Jesus, and it says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. These are post-resurrection appearances. Appearing to them 40 days, and what did he talk about in the post-resurrection appearances when he appeared to them? He spoke to them of what? Of the kingdom of God. How would you like to have been there listening to the resurrected Christ but in those 40 days before his ascension and listen to his take on the kingdom of God. This is what he was talking about. And so naturally, what did the disciples say? Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they came together, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? Like if we're going to do this kingdom thing, let's do it right now. They didn't quite understand the full expression of the kingdom. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. You have a, a beautiful character in the Bible who's an evangelist. His name is Philip. He happens to have uh, four daughters. Here in this case, it's in Acts in chapter 8 and verse 12. It says, when they believed Philip as he preached good news, what was he preaching about? about the kingdom of God. Look in Acts chapter 14 and verse 12. In Acts chapter 14, um, this is in verse 22, not 12, 22. And this is Paul, and this is quite a lively story here. So let's just back up to verse 19. And, and, and the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded crowds, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, and suppose he was dead. That was a pretty thorough stoning. They said, yeah, he's dead. We need to worry about him. He's dead. 
But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up. Did, was he resurrected or did he, was he not dead? <laughs> he entered the city, and the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they preached the gospel to the city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. That's some holy hootspa right there. You get stoned. I'm like, if I get stoned, I'm taking a break for a while. I mean, stoned as in got rocks on top of me. The other stone, we don't do that. But you know what I'm saying? Stone with rocks. Yeah. If I get piled, if people pile rocks on top of me and they go, check Ken, he's dead. I'm not preaching the next day. I don't think so. Paul goes back. It's like, okay, guys, let's like wipe the blood off. Let's go back in town. And he goes, just got to love that. And then it says in, in verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, like, yeah, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom. He says with a big knot on his head. Through many tribulations, we must enter the what? The kingdom. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Jesus taught about the kingdom. The apostles preached the kingdom. In this case, it's like synonymous with the preaching of the gospel. It, because there is this rule of Christ. This quiet, invisible growing rule of Christ in our hearts, in our churches, in our nation, when other things are going on and people misunderstand, there's this quiet, invisible movement of Jesus' people that is powerful, that is spirit-inspired. It's the kingdom. It's an expression of the kingdom. In chapter 19 of Acts, we're almost done with this little survey. In chapter 19 of Acts, in verse 8, this is Paul's first missionary journey. He goes to Ephesus, it says in verse 8, he entered the synagogue, and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about what? You guessed it, the kingdom of God. You see this all throughout Acts, which is a description of the early church. They're preaching what? The kingdom, the rule of Christ, that Jesus is the king, that we submit to the king Jesus. And it's always like, a good news. It's not like bad news. It's good news. There's a word for preach called, uh, in the Greek, caruso. It's a herald word. It's the herald word. The herald for the king. Congratulations if your name is Harold right now, right? You're the herald of the king, which means you don't have a word from yourself. You have a word from the king. And preachers and witnesses are heralds of the king. We take the message from the king and we tell it to the people and it's good news, not bad. It's good news, not bad. The kingdom message is a good message. It's a good message. It's a happy message. It's Unless, of course, you reject it, then it's not happy. And so the kingdom, that's what the herald does. He comes out with a message from the king. And he says, uh, you are condemned to die forever. And you deserve to die. But good news. The king has, wants you to know that his own son, Jesus, has paid the price for your sin. And there's a window of opportunity for you to repent and join his side. And Jesus will take your sin upon himself and give you his righteousness and you can be a part of my eternal kingdom and that's the kingdom your heart always longed for even if you never understood that's what your heart was always longing for. This is a good news thing. The kingdom of Jesus. The kingdom of God. And in the book of Acts, that's the message that they were preaching. The message of the kingdom. In Acts chapter 20, Paul meets with the Ephesian uh, elders and he speaks again of the kingdom. This is a, he asked the Ephesian elders to meet him at the seashore. He's getting ready to go to Jerusalem. He has a premonition that he's going to suffer and die. In verse 25 of Acts chapter 20, and now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have been proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. So Paul called the proclamation of the resurrection message, the proclamation of the gospel, the kingdom message. Are you, are you understanding this? After Jesus was, came and lived on earth and a sinlessly perfect life, and he died and was buried and rose again, then he told his apostles, I want you to go and spread Jesus communities everywhere, create a movement, I'll empower you with the Holy Spirit. This is going to be like an invisible kingdom. Do you understand? you got to understand this to understand the world that you live in. There's a, there's a quiet, invisible kingdom of God that is growing right now and you can be a part of that kingdom 
and Jesus can be your king. There is a kingdom now. That's what I'm saying. There is a, a kingdom right now. That's why it's important for us to understand the story about Jesus not being understood or being rejected as the king because you have to make the same decision every day about the kingdom now. Will Jesus be your king and will you invest in this right now, here and now kingdom? And so it's pretty interesting when you get to the end of the book of Acts and you, you really don't have the closure on what happens to Paul because at the end of the book of, of Acts, the story just is kind of open. He's still living in, under house arrest. But notice in Acts 28, 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers from morning till evening. And what did he do? He expounded to them testifying of, guess what he talked about? Yeah, that's right, the kingdom of God. And the very last verse of the book of Acts, he lived two whole years at his own expense. He welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is what Jesus did, or what Paul did. Paul, so this is the, the entire book of Acts. Do you see that? From the first chapter of Acts to the last chapter of Acts and throughout the book of Acts, it, one of the ways that the, the apostles talked about the progress of the good news about Jesus was they called it the kingdom, which means if there's a kingdom, there's a king. And that's the second thing that we need to understand. Why is that story important? The story is important because there's a kingdom now, and the story is important because there's a kingdom, there's a king, there's a king, and he's a good king. And he's a kind king, and he's a merciful king, and he's a loving king, and he's a coming king, and he's a sweet king, and he's a thoughtful king, and he's a dangerous king, and he's a just king, and he's a righteous king, and he will rule someday, and he has the right to rule. And this is not optional for any of us because we will face the king someday. And so this wonderful king, the king that, you know, loved little children and blessed them and prayed for them. Now, the king that cast demons out of people, even a little, gir little girl at one point. And the king that went to all people, not just Jews, but Gentiles. Not just wealthy, but poor. Not just smart, but troubled people. The king that would go into a room, King Jesus would go into a room, and he would not look for the righteous, but he would look for the unrighteous. He would look for the guilty. He would look for people with a checkered past. He would look for hopeless people. He would look for broken people. When he came in the room, he would look for the most messed up person. That's so beautiful. That's why thousands of people are going to spend this week with quiet thoughts about King Jesus because of what he's done in our lives because he's a wonderful king. And it seems sad, doesn't it, that he comes into Jerusalem and it's almost a pitiful scene. It's a sad scene almost. People are shouting then, but they're, they're not going to really immediately make him king. It's all kind of confusing, and it seems like it ends with a whimper there. Comes into the town the next day, cleanses the temple, and calls them out because they haven't given a place for Gentiles to come and, and worship when the place was supposed to be called a house of prayer. And the thing really seems to go sideways, doesn't it? The story's important because there's a current kingdom and the story is important because there's a current king and the story is important because there's a coming kingdom and the story is important because there's a coming king there's a kingdom yet to come the eternal state if you read the bible through and you understand it you realize that one day king jesus is going to come as a matter of fact this coronation of the king it's sort of sad right but it's not going to be his only coronation can i show you another one take your bibles and look to in the book of revelation and I'll give you just a little picture of heaven. We did this early on in our ministry. And then I'll show you this. Um, there's going to be another coming of the king. And this is one we ought to always keep in mind on Palm Sunday. In Revelation in chapter 5, you, have a, you know this. If you were here early on when I came, we talked about the throne room of heaven and a picture of the throne room of heaven. And so we have here a picture that God gives to persecuted people about what it looks like in heaven while they're going through hardship and in, in, in chapter uh, 5, it would be a good place for us to begin uh, in, in verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, this is the lamb, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
That's the suffering saints, by the way. And they sang a new song. They said, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Folks, listen. This isn't just kind of like mythology. This isn't poetry. This is prophecy. This is going to happen in space and time. It's Jesus the King is going to be worshipped in heaven by all those who yielded to him as king. And those who don't, well, we'll see that later. So you understand, this is, this is reality. This is history written ahead of time. And so I'm in verse 10. And you have made him a, them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped him don't you just love that don't you just love that listen folks you have the privilege of knowing how this thing is going to end that's why the king stories are important stories now let's have some fun and let's go to the fun part of the bible revelation chapter 19 it's fun for those who have yielded to him this is the coronation of the king when it comes to the end in revelation chapter 19 and verse 11 and then i saw heaven open and behold a white horse no baby donkey now right a white horse the one sitting on it called faithful and true and in his righteousness he judges and he makes war his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself and he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of god and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen white and pure are following him on white horses from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he, he will tread the wine press of fury of the wrath of god the almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written king of kings and lord of lords that's why the king story is important because when this thing comes to its end and its beginning the king comes back and he rewards the faithful and he judges those who reject him. And you don't know when your time is over. If you are not a loyal follower of the king today, I would get a palm branch in hand. I would bow my knee before the king. I would want this king to be my king. I would say, God, you're my king. And I will serve you forever. And I will do kingdom things. For instance, went to a banquet last night. At the banquet, they were talking about a camp that's not far from here. Some of you may have heard of it, right? And kids that go to the camp, 80% of them are kids who have not really heard the story of Jesus. So if you want to do a kingdom thing, you go find a kid like that, and you could pay his way. Then you could go home, and you could get on your knees, and you could pray, oh God, help that little heart to feel the love of Jesus at that camp this week, and help that little heart and mind to open up to King Jesus. You would be doing something that would never be taken away from you. Folks, that is not monopoly money and plastic kingdom. That's not a petty thing. That's a forever thing. And so wise people don't squander their time on play money and plastic kingdoms. They follow King Jesus and they do things for the kingdom. They do kingdom work. They're excited about kingdom things. As simple as helping somebody with their plumbing in Jesus' name. As simple as watching the nursery in Jesus' name. As simple as learning the names of your neighbors and graciously inviting them to Easter in Jesus' name. This is quiet kingdom work that Jesus is your king. He says he rewards these things. This is how we want to spend our lives in service of the king of kings and of the Lord of lords. That makes sense. Everyone else is burning their life on play money and plastic kingdoms that are silly and petty. And there's a name for people like that. I won't be ugly, but a person who would do that is a fool. Is a fool. There's another piece of the story that is often overlooked. Look back in chapter 19 of Luke. Something only Luke mentions here. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem, I was reading um, Alfred Edersheim, who's written a beautiful biography of Jesus, Life and Times of Jesus Messiah. 
And he's a Jewish man, very familiar with the, the Holy Land, the land of Jesus. He says there's a place on the trail, on the road from Bethany to Jerusalem where you come around the side of the Mount of Olives and then Jerusalem comes into view. When Jesus is riding in and everyone is shouting and the group has come out from Jerusalem and they're shouting Hosanna and the little children are shouting Hosanna and the group that comes with him are shouting Hosanna and they're saying save now and they're waving palm branches. There's a, the fire has leapt from heart to heart to heart to heart and the people have a mixture of enthusiasm and devotion and, and, there is this, and, and some of them obviously jealousy and hatred but there's this powerful scene. And then as all the people are just shouting, as they're exalting, Jesus then, he turns, comes around this corner and he sees Jerusalem. And when he sees Jerusalem, he doesn't see Jerusalem on a beautiful spring day in April with the flowers blossoming and with the crowd swelling Jerusalem for this great festival and all that goes with that. Jesus' eyes see Jerusalem looking forward after it falls to Rome. And that's why it says here in chapter 19 and verse 41, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. And the word there for weep is not the same quiet weeping that he did at Lazarus' funeral. It's loud lament. He laments over the city. And he says, what? That you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. If only you had realized I'm coming to bring a peaceful kingdom, but you can't see it. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon the other because you did not know the time of your visitation. The idea here is when the bishop came to watch over you, you didn't understand this was your time. Because you didn't understand this was your time, you don't have peace and you don't suffer alone but Jesus says, your, your children will suffer with you. And this was a powerfully prophetic statement because in AD 70, when Titus and the Roman hordes came in and they, they destroyed, they raised Jerusalem, burning it to the ground, throwing priests off the, the, the city walls. If you read Josephus, the most uh, accurate historian, the most uh, uh, detailed historian of the time, it's hard to read. It's such a vile thing that happens. And this is what Jesus sees. And my friends, here's what I'm, I want to tell you. I want to tell you about tender Jesus, meek and mild, because he is. I want to tell you how good he is to deliver you and help you and love you. I want to tell you how sweet and kind and benevolent he is. But I also need to know, you also need to know that if you don't follow Jesus, you will regret it with, a great, with, a, with an eternal regret. If you say, I can take him or leave him, you'll discover one day that really wasn't an option. One day we all stand before this King Jesus And he's the judge of the entire universe, including each of us. I heard about a man named John. He was uh, played Monopoly with his grandmother all the time. She was really good at Monopoly, and she always beat him. His goal in life was one day to beat his grandmother in Monopoly. So one summer, he spent the entire summer playing Monopoly, hours of Monopoly with all of his friends. And then in the fall of the year, he said to his grandmother, hey, Grandma, you want to play Monopoly? And he owned her. He had no mercy. She would always say to him, someday you will learn to play this game. And after he took away all her houses and railroads and utilities and he owned everything, and he took her very last dollar, he had no mercy on his grandmother. His grandmother said, well, I see you've learned to play the game. Now there's something else I need to teach you. She said to him, Johnny... When the game is over, everything goes back in the box. And the box goes back in the closet. And when the game of our life is over, and everything that we've gained or thought was important or valuable, and we find out that it's play money and a plastic kingdom, it's going to be a, we're not going to be the only ones who suffer. But all the people that we could have influenced for Christ will also suffer because of that. I go to camps every once in a while, talk to kids at camp. And I like to talk to them sometimes about what's really important to them at camp. And what's important to a kid at camp a lot of times is that whole guy-girl thing. And uh, I get that. That's a part of life. It's a pretty natural part of life. And they, they often wonder, you know, is there going to be somebody for me? And they, they, sometimes they think maybe I'll 
have to compromise. Maybe I'll have to kind of lower my standards. Maybe I'll have to break the rules. I wonder if there'll be anybody for me. And so I, so I kind of came up with a little story that I tell them. So once there was this brute, fellow that was, he was just a notch above a beast. He was a brute of a man. And he was out in the forest one day. And out in the forest one day, he caught sight of a lovely young lady, a beautiful, the most beautiful young lady he had ever seen, and began to tell his friends. And they said, well, that is a, not just a, a beautiful young woman. That's the king's daughter. She's a princess. And he said, but I love her. And they said, you're a fool. You'll never win her. But whenever he got a chance, he would go up to her and he would begin to ask for her hand in marriage. And she was kind and she was gracious, but she said to him, I could never marry a brute like yourself. I am a king's daughter, and so I would have to marry a noble man. And he said, well, what is a noble man? And she said, a noble man is a man who attends to the needs of the king. A noble man is a man who admires the king. A noble man is a man who loves the king. A noble man is a man who serves the king. And so the brute went away, and he got a job in the basement of the castle. And he began to observe the king every day. And he began to love the king. And he began to serve the king. He gave his whole mind and might and strength to admiring and to serving the king. And doing whatever the king asked him to do. Until one day, a few years later, the king called him into his presence. And he said to him, son, you have become one of the finest noblemen in my entire kingdom I have a special assignment for you. I'd like you to marry my daughter.